He's a provider. He's a sustainer. He's a way maker. Amen. Amen. When it comes to giving thanks to God, you don't need anybody else's testimony. All you got to do is look back through your own life. Look at how many times you were standing at a valley trying to figure out how you were going to get across that valley and realize that it's through the God of my salvation who was a bridge over the valley that I was able to get through the valley. The times in my life when God was a tunnel through that mountain. And God was a bridge over troubled waters. He was a heart fixer. When my heart was broken, when I was lonely, God came in and wrapped his loving arms around me. Uh, you think about back to the points in your life when you were low and God raised you. Yeah. appreciate the encouragement from you from this uh, trust the process preaching series um, I'm gonna say this and we're gonna move to Gideon uh, chapter chapter 6 I think it is um, I giggle at y'all because every series y'all act like it was better than the last one <laughs> so at some point it's like uh, alright it is what it is so I want you to know that in totality this message is out of Gideon chapter 6 Judges I'm sorry Judges chapter 6 I was just checking to see if y'all was paying attention Judges chapter 6, so I can't read all of Judges chapter 6, so I'm going to look for your reading from verse 36 through 40, but as you work with this text this week, as you kind of go back through your notes, uh, you'll notice that it's from verse 11 through 40, and truthfully, the story goes right on into chapter 7. Um, so I'm reading verse 36 through 40, but you'll know that it's the whole chapter. Verse 36 says, Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand as you have promised, look, I will place a wool fleece on the threshing floor and if there is dew only on the fleece and all the ground is dry, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you said. And that is what happened. Gideon rose early the next day and squeezed the fleece and wrung out the dew, a bowl full of water. And then Gideon said to God, do not be angry with me. Let me make just one more request. Allow me one more test with the fleece. This time, make the fleece dry and the ground covered with dew. That night, God did so, only the fleece was dry and all the ground was covered with dew. Father in heaven, here's your children gathered this morning to praise your holy and righteous name to declare that there is no God like our God, that our God is an awesome God and he can do anything but fail. We declare that our God has moved so many mountains out of our way. We declare flat-footedly, we declare unapologetically that our God is an awesome God. That our God is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, but we declare that he's the God of Frankie. 
He's the God of Clarice. He's the God of James. He's the God of Shayla and Shatia. He's our God. All of us claim you, not just as the God of Israel, but the God of Southern friendship. Now, God, we pray that you stand up in my body. We pray, oh God, that you would preach through my mouth. We pray, God, for power in this pulpit. We pray, God, that your people would be able to log off saying, I heard a word, that they'd be able to walk out saying, I heard a word that I'm strengthened, that I'm stronger because of the preached word of God. We pray in that name that is above every name, the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Hello, my name is Gideon. And I am the son of Joash and a breeze right who is of the uh, tribe of Manasseh, who is of the tribes of Israel. And if you will let me, I understand that y'all been talking about trust the process. And today I want to talk to y'all and tell you about the time when I had to trust God's process in my own life. And I want to talk to y'all with this simple subject of when God wants to use you to make a difference. Sometimes God wants to use you to make a difference. Now, Israel is, is the people that I come from, and Israel is often caught in this wash and rinse cycle. Israel are the favorite people of God. They are the peculiar people of God, and God favors them with this unceasing amount of favor. But Israel has a problem because every time God favors Israel, Israel lets its guard down. Israel messes up against God. God gets mad at Israel because they mess up against God. God punishes Israel by using their enemies to punish them. While Israel is captive to their enemies, they cry out to God to ask for deliverance. God will eventually hear Israel in crying out for their deliverance. God will eventually move on Israel's behalf. Israel is delivered. Israel feels the favor of God again. God blesses them abundantly. When they get blessed, they forget what it feels like to be captive. They start the process of sinning against God all over again. And it's a simple wash and repeat process. By the time we get to Judges chapter 6, Israel is captive to Midian. And the Midianites are not treating us well. And so here we are captive as the children of God crying out as we have done in times before. When Israel was captive in Egypt, they cried out and God sent them Moses. And time after time again, Israel finds itself in trouble, calls out to God, and God sends someone to lead Israel out of captivity. So by the time I come on the scene, Midian is treating us bad. I'm threshing wheat inside of a wine press because I don't want the Midianites to know what I'm doing. And even though I'm hiding from the Midianites, God knows where I am. And God shows up while I'm threshing wheat in the wine press so that I can be hidden from the Midianites. And God says that I'm going to use you, Gideon. So God responded to Israel's crying by sending a prophet. And the prophet warns Israel that you all are in the predicament that you in because you served other gods. When you serve other gods, you violate who God is because God is jealous and he does not want any of his children in a relationship with him and in a relationship with other gods. So God is jealous of Israel and 
he now uh, punishes Israel, but he is ready to deliver Israel. While I'm in the wine press, uh, threshing out my wheat, he shows up and he says to me, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. I got a problem now because I'm saying, how is the Lord with us and we in all this trouble? How is the Lord with us and we are captive to Midian and the Midianites are treating us the way that they do? I'm confused by this statement about the Lord is with us. And uh, if the Lord is with us, where is the Lord's hand like we read about from our forefathers who are telling us about how God brought uh, Israel out of Egypt, how he brought them across the Red Sea and how he brought them across the Jordan River? How is God with us? Midian is treating us like it does. God says, don't you worry about all that. Because you are about to go forth in strength. You're about to go forth in power. And he turns and he says, am I not sending you? I'm sending you. Don't you worry about where you are. And I know y'all are used to getting points. And so I need to give you the first point that you have. And that is your background does not prevent God from using you. Don't you use your background as an excuse that you cannot be used by God. I don't care where you come from. Doesn't matter if you come from Barry Farm. Doesn't matter if you come from the worst parts of Southeast. Doesn't matter if you come from the worst parts of Prince George's County. Doesn't matter where you have come from. God can use you. So I replied, but how? How, how are you going to use me? Since I'm only of the tribe of Manasseh and that I'm only of one of the weakest clans in the tribe of Manasseh and my family is one of the weakest families in the tribe of Manasseh. And if that wasn't bad enough, I'm not even one of the greatest people in my family. But the Lord answered me that he would use me in spite of that. Here's what God says that I and you together are going to deliver Israel from the Midianites. So y'all know Tasha Cobb sing this song, Lord, if I find faith. She was quoting me because I said to God, God, if I find favor in your sight, you're going to have to show me that you want to use me. You're going to have to show me now that, that you intend to use me to deliver Israel. So I said to him, listen, you got to wait here until I come back. And, and the angel of the Lord said, I ain't going nowhere. I'm going to wait right here. And so I run home and I fixed him some curried goat. Uh, I ran home and put together some... Um, some, some of those biscuits, you know, you can buy the biscuit mix from uh, Red Lobster. I put together some curried goat and some Red Lobster cheese biscuits, brought him back some soup, and I came, and he waited for me. Waited for me until I came back, and I got there back with, with it. He was under the oak tree of Ophrah, and uh, when I got there, he said, put it on the rock. When I put it on the rock, he took his stick and uh, his, his staff that was in his hand and burned it all up. It was all gone in an instant. And at that moment, I knew that God was doing something special. And I said, ah, sovereign Lord, I understand now that you're here with me. He said, listen, you don't have to worry about it because although you have seen an angel face to face, you're not going to die. Peace, he said, do not be afraid you're not going to die. And after that, I built an altar because it's appropriate to worship. Whenever God makes himself present, 
Whenever God makes you clear that he is present, the appropriate response to the presence of God is worship. The appropriate response when you know that God is sitting in the row with you is to raise your hands and worship. The appropriate response to knowing that you're in a room where the presence of God is sitting down is to open up your mouth and to say hallelujah, I bless your name. There is nobody like you. You are my keeper. You are my sustainer. The appropriate worship is even if you don't build an altar, is to act like you're at the altar and worship God. Mm. So I, I built this altar and I called it the Lord is peace. God can use you regardless of what your background is. Can I give you the second piece though? And that is when God makes himself clear to you that he is talking to you, because he intends to use you, it is important then, secondly, to obey God immediately. This ain't no time when God is making himself plain to you for you to be procrastinating, for you to be pontificating about whether or not you're going to do it. And so later that night, the Lord said to me, take the second of your father's bulls, uh, the one that is seven years old, and, and he said to me, tear down your father's uh, uh, worship of, of Baal. Tear it down. Then there's a Asherah pole, that's worship of a Asherah. You're going to tear that down too. Now, I was just scared, so I needed to go do it when wasn't nobody looking. So I got 10 of my boys together, and we went and tore the altar to bail down, and we cut down the Asherah pole, but we did it at night so nobody would know that we're doing it. Now, in the morning when they got up and they saw that the altar to bail was gone, and they saw that the Asherah pole had been cut down and that I took all of that and made an altar out of it, took the bull and put it on the altar, and then they come around trying to figure out, well, who did all this? Now, I'm in the house acting like I ain't got nothing to do with it. While I'm in the house acting like I have nothing to do with it, somebody told on them, and it didn't take them long to figure out that Gideon had torn down the uh, altar of Baal and cut up the pole, the Asherah pole, and had created an altar. And so they came to my daddy's house looking for me, looking for Gideon, saying to my daddy, bring Gideon out. Now, my daddy didn't say anything when they had... The, the altar to Baal there in the camp. He didn't say anything when they had the pole for a sharer, but when they came to my daddy's house to do something to his son, they saying, bring him out because we're going to kill him. Then my daddy asked them, does the, the God Baal that y'all defending need you to defend him when somebody tears down his altar? And my daddy didn't say nothing when they had the altar there, but he did say something when he came up. And so they began to call me Jerubbabel because I had contempt for the altar of Baal. So right after that, the Lord began to move in my life and the spirit of God came upon me. And in the spirit of God coming upon me, the the, uh, the, the Midianites are beginning to move against Israel the way they had always moved against Israel, except they didn't know the circumstances had changed. Can I give you all the third thing that you, those of y'all that take a notes, here, here's the third thing. God will assure you of your calling. God will call you, but then he will make sure that you are assured that he intends to use you because I wasn't really sure 
I, I, I knew, but I wasn't sure, sure, as y'all say it. I wasn't sure, sure that God was intending to move me. So the oppressors of Midian, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the other people joined forces to come against Israel and they crossed the Jordan River and they camped in the valley of Jezreel so that that was where all of our crops grew. And what they did to us on a continual basis is let us grow all these crops and then then at the time of harvest, they would come down and take all the stuff that we had grown, except when they did it this time, they did not know that they were coming into our territory and God had anointed me. So I took out my shafar and I blew my shafar. And when I blew my shafar, I called all of those who was of the small tribe of Manasseh. I called all of those who were of the least family so that we could fight against the Midianites. But I was still a little bit unsure. I believed that God was with me, I believed that God was going to use me, but I still had a little smidgen of doubt. And so I said, God, I need just a little bit more convincing. And I would beg your patience, God, that while I'm going to do what you told me to do, I just need to know that we're not about to get our tails whipped. I need to know that you really going to be with us and say, so Lord, don't be angry with me. But I want to put you to a little test. I want to take some wool fleece and I want to put the fleece in the wine press where you first spoke to me. And while the fleece is on the ground, when you allow the dew in the morning to come, I want the dew not to be on the ground, but on the piece of fleece that I put inside the wine press. Make it so that only the fleece has dew on it. And don't you know when I got up in the morning and went to look inside the wine press that the piece of fleece that I had left there was wet and I could wring out a whole bowl full of water out of that piece of fleece. And don't judge me, don't hate, don't look at me sideways because even though I had seen God pull up the fruit, the, uh, the, the curry goat and, and, the, uh, and the biscuits that I had put in front of him, even though I had seen the fleece wet, I still needed one more. So I said, okay, can, can you do one more thing for me? I'm, I'm almost convinced. I'm, I'm not there yet because I know church folks, they look down on you when they know your story. The truth is they can only look down on you because you don't know their story. They, they look at you sideways when they know how trifling you've been, but they don't tell you how trifling they've been. So, so I said, God, I need, I need one more thing from you. Uh, last time I had you make the fleece wet and let the ground be dry. But when we do it this time, I need you to do, I need you to flip it and do it the other way. This time, let the ground be wet with dew, but let that piece of fleece that you wet yesterday, today, let it be dry. So I went on the bed putting God to the test, but got up in the morning and don't you know that the fleece was dry and the ground was wet and that was all of the convincing that I needed that God was getting ready to use me in his army. Now, you might be looking at me in my story as Gideon telling you all about that time when God called me into the ministry, but what about you? What about when God is trying to get your attention? Because if there's anybody who can understand being reluctant, who is being slow, being reserved with moving into ministry, if there's anybody who can understand that, I can understand. I can understand coming from Anacostia and not feeling like that you're too much of that. I understand coming from Barry Farm. I understand coming from Landover. I understand coming from a town that got heights in its last name. I understand. I understand. But that's not an under, that's not an excuse for not allowing God to use you. 
God calls people not because of what they can do, but because of what he can do. I'm here to tell y'all that the God of heaven, the God of the earth, the creator and the sustainer of all mankind will use even you if you let him. Now, are you in a place where you're saying, God, I can't let, I can't do anything on your behalf unless you convince me? And for some of us, God has convinced us. We still ain't going to do nothing. He's done more than a little bit in order to convince us that he plus anybody is enough. But we will convince ourselves that because of my background, because of my poor education, because of my circumstances, God, you can't use me. God says, I can. Because it's not about you. It's about me. You see, when you put you with God together, you're more than the whole world against you. But the question is, am I convinced that God will be with me in what he is assigning me to do? I can't be in a place where I'm thinking God has nothing for me to do. And if he has something for me to do, why am I doing nothing? Is it in fact that God has been trying to get my attention? Well, I'm just hard of hearing. Is it in fact that God is ringing my phone? I just got it on mute. I got it on silent. And if I were more modern, maybe I have blocked God from calling me. A friend of mine, dead and gone now, but I noticed every time I called him, my phone went straight to voicemail. And so I asked, have you blocked me? He goes, no, I ain't blocked you. So we're standing right next to each other, and I called him. I called him, standing right next to him, and said, well, why your phone didn't ring? Pulled my profile up and scrolled down to go, you blocked me. And he said, I don't know how that happened. He's like, okay, well, I'm, um, I don't know how that happened either, except you blocked me. And while y'all laughing at my friend, I'm wondering if you've blocked God. So he too is calling you, except he goes straight to voicemail every time he tries to get your attention. Y'all ain't saying nothing in here. Uh, I'm wondering now if he's blocked. Because saying, don't matter how many times you call me, I'm not fitting to do what you want me to do. God uses a perfect Jesus to come down through 42 generations and in his perfection call imperfect people to cry to God. Jesus in perfection calls the imperfect to come and live with God. So if he can call us in our imperfection, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You do not need now to be perfect in order for God to use you because he loves you enough while you're imperfect to die for you. So if I can love you when you're imperfect and die for you, I can use you when you're imperfect and use you to do work in my kingdom. I don't need you to be perfect. Here's what God is saying. I'm perfect. God uses imperfect people because he's perfect. 
And when we take our imperfection and put it next to his perfection, that which is imperfect becomes perfect. Now, let me give you some application because you need something to do with this this week. So you're going to have an opportunity where God is calling you. I'm telling you, God's going to call you. God's going to call you to get off the bench and get in the game. God's going to call you to get out of the bleachers. So to be on the bench is suggesting that I'm close to the court or that I'm close to the field. Some of us won't get close to the field. We're in the bleachers. Some of us aren't in the bleachers. We outside scalping tickets. Uh, we're outside selling sweatshirts and hoodies. Uh, but, but God is calling you to not just be around the game, but to get in the game. Y'all ain't saying amen. Uh, and so when God calls you, you may be at this place where you are doubting your worthiness. You're doubting whether or not God can use you. Here's what I want you to remember. Put this in your heart, in your spirit, that if God can use Gideon with all of his imperfections, with all of his insecurities, then God can use you. He can. Ain't no need in you bringing up that you use broken English. God knew you had broken English when he was calling you. you. You using your lack of education is not an excuse. God calling you with, uh, well, Pastor, you don't know, all I got is a general equivalency diploma. That, that, God doesn't care about that. I only did my first year of junior college. God doesn't care about that. Uh, I only have an associate's degree from God doesn't care about none of that stuff. He doesn't care about all the mistakes you've made in your life. God cares that when there is someone who needs to be delivered, I need someone to let me use them to deliver my people. And everybody can't be scared. Somebody has to go. And the question is, Will you allow God to take your process to develop you so that he can use you? Amen. Would y'all give the Lord a praise? Today you might be here. You might be saying, Pastor, I've never given God an opportunity to use me for anything. But because of what's going on in my life, because of the preaching, because of the teaching, I now am convinced that I should give God a chance.